Hello? Oh, there I am. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Susan DeCastro. I'm the Ward 4 City Councilor. I'm thrilled to see you all tonight because the last Ward 4 meeting I was able, able to have was in early January 2020. And of course, there's been a lot of pandemic since then. So thank you for coming out tonight. I thank everyone who watches this thereafter on video. Uh, let me give you a quick um, review of how tonight is going to go. Um, we're going to start with a presentation by the developers of a proposed solar field at 634 Summer Street. And I sent out about 100 abutters notices to that end to people who live near it in hopes that they would come and listen to this. Um, and after that, I have Mayor Sullivan coming. I have uh, Brockton Fire Chief Brian Nardelli, Brockton Police Chief Emmanuel Gomes, and Ward 4 School Committee Member Tony Rodriguez. So I've got a great lineup for you, a lot of information. I think what will happen is these gentlemen will make this solar field presentation. They can take questions and I'll allow them to clear out. And then I'll have all of our city officials speak and then we'll take questions from them. Okay. Um, was there something I wanted to say? I'm working hard. And since January of 2018, I've handled over 600 calls and emails and messages from residents. Um, Word 4 is busy, and, and we've come a long way since January 1st of 2018. I find that the biggest resident concerns are quality of life issues, public safety issues, and economic development, and to that end, our speakers will be um, addressing those issues tonight. Our schools, after several hard years, are better resourced and positioned um, to my, my great joy. Um, I'll take questions at the end, and so now take it away, Solar Field. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm gonna lead off. My name is Jim Burke. I'm an attorney at law with offices at 48 North Pearl Street in Brockton. And I have the pleasure to represent uh, Brophy and Phillips, who own this particular property and have owned it for a number of years. What we're going to do tonight is provide a presentation. It's not a public hearing, but it's an informational setting in which we're going to propose uh, or provide you with the proposal that they're going to bring before the Zoning Board of Appeals in the near future. They've already been to the Conservation Commission and received uh, basically a order of conditions, I guess, for the project. So, essentially, uh, the Commonwealth made a commitment to support uh, green projects uh, a number of years ago, and as part of that, they developed something called the SMART program. The SMART program is uh, a, a, a state-funded program in which they provide certain benefits and tax credits for uh, alternative energy projects. This is going to be one of them. This specific site, as many of you know, uh, held uh, some major commercial structures uh, that were part of the development of the shoe industry going back to the turn of the century. Those buildings were demolished by Brophy and Phillips uh, after they acquired it when it became clear that they were no longer structurally sound. Uh, they made an attempt to provide an alternative use, and they provided some permitting requests related to a multifamily project, and it was determined by the uh, general uh, neighborhood that that wasn't the best utilization or idea for the specific project, so it did not go forward. But this project uh, is, I believe, uh, an excellent uh, reuse for the, this old industrial property because uh, it's going to be done sensitively uh, for the surrounding neighborhood. Uh, what you're going to have is roughly on a 5.45 acre site, roughly five acres of solar panels. Uh, the site contour configuration, many of you may know if you live in the area, it goes from front to back and then at the end it picks up. It's surrounded by basically uh, open space land owned by the city of Brockton. Uh, there is an industrial project uh, or industrial business uh, uh, commercially or otherwise that I believe the city just acquired uh, immediately adjacent to it. And then there are a number of neighbors. Uh, what this project is going to do is it's going to set up panels uh, that were going to be uh, ultimately converted to electricity uh, and 
With me today is Steve Giosa, who is the engineer, and he's going to provide the information, and we have the developer uh, for the building project, uh, Bill Bennett. Uh, the, be the best part of uh, this specific project from the developer's perspective is that solar panels in Massachusetts are allowed uses on a Mass General Law Chapter 43A. So what we have to do is basically provide a project uh, that does not interfere with public health, safety, or welfare. We're going to apply for a special permit, and as part of that process, go to the Zoning Board of Appeals, and we're going to have to be neighborhood friendly. One of the things that we're going to do as part of the project is to make sure there's substantial buffering in the front of the property uh, to reduce the impact uh, for the neighbors in question. So I've spoken too much, uh, and I'm going to let Steve go ahead and uh, give you a rundown on the specifics of the project. Thank you. Uh, just so everybody knows, my name is Steve Giosa. I am a, a licensed civil engineer uh, working for SciTech Incorporated. We're part of Civil and Environmental Consultants, and we're based in Raynham, Mass. Um, I've been practicing civil engineering for about 40 years and have been doing large-scale solar projects for a number of solar developers probably for about 15 years and, and been involved in a little over 20 uh, projects throughout southeastern Massachusetts and heading all the way out into western Mass, um, basically between, West Brookfield, between uh, Worcester and Springfield. So a large geographic area, everything from urban areas. We've done solar projects in New Bedford. Um, and every type of project from this type, which I'll explain a little bit about, uh, which is uh, typically identified as a large-scale solar. It's panels mounted on racks, uh, attached to the ground, um, but we've also done canopy type solar projects uh, for carports and uh, industrial facilities uh, as well as this type of uh, site, which we would characterize as a rehabilitation of an older industrial facility, as Attorney Burke indicated. Um, I've got two basic exhibits here just to kind of walk you through the property a little bit and give you an orientation and then talk a little bit about the specifics of the project. This first exhibit here, which just has the yellow outline, the yellow represents the borders of the subject property. And just for orientation, north is to the top. The undeveloped land that Attorney Burke mentioned wraps on the east side and wraps around to the south side of the site. So this is dominated by undeveloped land, including some uh, designated wetland resource areas. Uh, we've got the rehabilitation facility to the north and residential properties bordering us on the east side. So on the opposite side of Summer Street and then two residential properties here uh, directly abutting the site. And the historic development of the site has really been confined to the uh, southwest corner or the southwest quadrant on the property. And again, as Attorney Burke indicated, you have Summer Street here on the western border of the site the land slopes down into the property, so this is much lower here. Stays pretty flat in the midsection, then it picks up again from a grade standpoint as you uh, continue walking or moving to the eastern side of the site. Um, the second exhibit gives you an overview of, again, the same orientation, the same scale drawing, and the outline of the property is basically the green shading. Um, the intent in this case is we orient the solar panels so they're facing south, and they're also set at an angle. So they're, they're set at an angle to catch the maximum capacity of the sun for the longest period of the day. And that south orientation where the panels are angled basically towards the bottom of the drawing here and actually away from Summer Street. So they're angled coming back this way at an angle that allows us to get maximum sun from east to west as it tracks for the longest period of the day. For a project of this type, there are a number of things we have to provide to make sure this project meets the, the state regulations, the um, utility company regulations, and that begins with the access to the property. We are proposing a driveway access to come in off summer it will taper down, so as the grade changes, we're actually keeping this grade dropping down 
And we'll have an access drive here with a little turnout for emergencies or for vehicles when they do enter so they don't have to back out into the public way. They'll have the ability to drive uh, headfirst back out into su uh, Summer Street so we're not promoting a backing up into the public way which could interfere with the flow of traffic on the street. But the advantage of this site is we do have that grade change, so this is now dropping down, and this access drive would probably average about four feet lower than the elevation of the street. So you've got a natural buffering already beginning at the beginning of the site here. Now that access drive will help us with construction. This will be the construction entrance to the project. And then when all the work is done, there will be a gate provided in this area, so we have security. Uh, for this facility. Because it is a large-scale solar project, we must provide fencing around the entire perimeter of the site, gated access. We provide the local emergency services, the police and fire, with a knox box so they have emergency access to the site at all times. Um, and that would occur at this location here on the property. So completely enclosed, the state regulations for this type of project mandate a seven foot fence to surround the project. So again, that gives us, again, a little bit more screening and buffering that'll occur. And again, the grade continues to drop down into this area where the project is supported by a number of pieces of equipment. So in addition to the solar panels, which are this blue shading that you see running across here, you'll see this little bit of gray blocks located in this location. And those are different pieces of equipment. They're low to the ground. Um, the exception is we have battery storage, energy storage, so that during uh, low production periods, energy is accumulated and then fed back into the grid during uh, periods where the production is not uh, generating because of the, uh, the, uh, the sun uh, shining on the panels themselves. So you have these battery storage units. Again, they're gonna be depressed. They, they look like a, a, a container, basically, a shipping container. But in this case, these units are set about five feet lower than the adjacent street. So we've got the street, a seven foot fence, about a five foot grade change, and then we have these units set in this low area here on the site. Understanding that we're, we have residential properties here to the northwest, uh, and we have on the west side of Summer Street residential properties, we did have our landscape architect, uh, Stephanie Fuss, uh, take a look at plantings. She's done uh, landscape plantings for solar projects in a number of communities um, here in southeastern Massachusetts, and she's, collect, she's created a mix of vegetation that would go outside the fence so we'll have the traveled way of Summer Street, a landscaped buffer, then the seven foot fence, then the grade change tapering down. So all of those things combine to create that buffering to the residential activity. And um, the panels would then be placed along the topography of the site as it exists today. There'll be a little bit of grade changes to the back there are some maximum slopes that we have to generate, so there'll be a little bit of earthwork on the back portion to taper some of the grade so that we don't exceed the tolerances for the solar company. That'll occur primarily here. And again, as this land slopes down to the middle, there is an existing drainage system which runs through the middle of the site. We'll be rehabilitating, inspecting, cleaning, and fixing that drainage system. But essentially, we're gonna be removing a lot of lot coverage that exists here, all the old foundations, the old pavement. Uh, this is a um, pollinator mix that would go in here to stabilize the uh, solar array uh, portion of the site. So there's no impervious surface being created here. So from a runoff and a um, environmental impact standpoint, this project is about as uh, green as you're going to get, forgetting the, the benefits of generating power in a renewable fashion. Um, and the reason I say that, when you look at the alternatives to development, whether this were redeveloped for some commercial use or residential use, once construction is done, there's probably a vehicle coming here maybe once a month. Everything is remotely monitored. There'll be periodic inspections and checking of equipment. 
Uh, very minor maintenance occurs uh, for these facilities, so there's not a lot of moving parts, things that break down on a regular basis. So you're not going to see some, something more than typically a pickup truck coming here every once in a while. So from a neighborhood standpoint, neighborhood impact, I know when we did the uh, initial proposal for the residential development, there was a lot of concern about generating traffic and additional traffic on the public way. This is as low a key project from a tra traffic generation as you're going to get. The construction process, and I, I'm sure Mr. Ben will talk a little bit more about this, is probably a four-month, five-month process. He'll, he'll, he'll be a little better on the, the timing of that. But once that construction's done, the site's stabilized, the vegetation is planted, um, you're barely going to notice that there's activity occurring on this property because there will be very infrequent visits uh, coming to the site. Um, again, the angling of this is away from the residential properties. So I know that a lot of times people are concerned that, you know, it's angled too closely towards them, you're going to see some reflection. This is a site that actually, with the panels angled and facing to the south in this direction, is actually away from all of the residential properties. And this down gradient slope, all of this is moving downhill from the higher end of the site to the lower end, you know, provides that natural buffering for this particular type of facility. So you're going to end up with less impervious surface, no traffic, no noise. This is a, um, again, as, as low key a project as you're going to get. No demands on public services. So from a municipal impact, you get the tax benefit of a project of this type where we're taking a tired old industrial site. We're not going into a pristine undeveloped land. I've walked this land, there's old construction debris and piping here in the back. I know there's been some issues with folks camping out here that uh, probably shouldn't and activities going on that probably shouldn't be occurring. I know our survey people and wetland people have encountered a number of uh, folks out here, but also a lot of debris and a lot of um, negative activity in a portion of the site that will go away with the utilization of the site and the securing of the site. So we think from a neighborhood standpoint, this is low impact and um, low intensity from a, a, how it, it will re reflect on the neighborhood itself in the future. So I think with that, without going into any more detail, I think I'll let Mr. Bennett just go into a little bit more of the, the mechanics. That's, this is his expertise. He will be the solar developer for this site. And uh, I'll turn it over to Bill. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bill Bennett. I'm a master electrician from Martha's Vineyard. Started doing solar in, in 1992 on small houses. And since then, we've uh, put in hundreds of uh, kind of residential, commercial, and what we call utility grade solar systems like this on the vineyard, some of them in Western Mass. But um, as you can imagine, in the vineyard, uh, it, there's not a lot of room, and people live pretty close to each other. So um, we've had to really work with uh, neighbors on our projects. Uh, we started doing commercial arrays like this, big ones, back in 2011. And we have neighbors on sides and front and back. And I don't have any enemies on the vineyard. So I want to put that out um, because they're pretty benign, as you mentioned. They uh, don't make a lot of noise hardly any the way we build them. The parts last 50 years. There's no moving parts other than cooling fans. And, um, and I'll go into how they're constructed in a second, but I just want to give you kind of an overview of, um, of what's involved. And so we have panels and we have inverters. Panels turn this, the sun power into power that can go back onto the grid. So if you're living in the neighborhood, uh, generally, if it's sunny out, the power you're using will probably have come from this field. We pump the power from the, from the uh, panels straight onto the grid. And so it ends up just going everywhere in the town and the surrounding area when we're generating. So this project um, will take about six months to build. Um, there'll be some site work to start with, where they'll do some grading and some clearing. And then after that, what'll happen is the, um, the infrastructure for all of the panels, which is driven piles that get you know, stuck into the ground, will happen and the racking will be built. That'll take probably three weeks. Once that happens, um, all the panels get installed and wired 
And then most of the work after that is kind of in this area, which will involve a national grid. They'll do their work with poles and pulling wires and things. And we'll do some work with uh, all the services, electrical services, and, and tying the batteries in. The batteries are basically in two big containers. They get put onto a, a cement pad and we wire them. It's pretty straightforward work. Um, and the, the idea of having the grass under this is excellent. We do that in the vineyard all the time. And a lot of our projects actually have sheep in them, which is, which is kind of cool. Uh, although the problem with the sheep is there's always a ram, so you have to be careful. Um, because they come out of nowhere and get you. But uh, in this case, we'll have grass, there'll be some mowing, there'll be very little maintenance. Uh, the batteries get maintained at least twice a year. They'll come out and do some maintenance work on the cooling systems and the cells themselves. And um, the inverters, uh, they'll be tied to the internet, so if the inverter has a problem, um, the owner will get an email and someone will come out and, and fix an inverter. Uh, other than that, they just quietly make power every day when it's sunny. The panels will last 50 years. They're self-contained, they're sealed, they're, they're completely safe uh, as far as chemicals go. All, all the components in here, we, we pick components that were safe. Uh, on the vineyard, um, we have uh, lots of people, uh, lots of density around the panels, and so we use a company called Solar Edge that makes a system that once the power is turned off, the, the, pan, the power out of the, out of the solar cells becomes uh, down to like volts, maybe in this case, 18 volts, which is like a nine volt battery times two. So very safe when the system gets turned off. And that's one of the requirements of um, the systems is it's a giant switch as you come into it, which turns off the entire system. So once that switch hits, uh, within 30 seconds, the whole field is dead. And that's a good, port good thing to know. And if somebody cuts a line uh, in the thing, it goes dead as well. So this company called Solar Edge is really great for, uh, for safety and reliability, plus the fact that they notify people uh, when something's wrong. Um, I'm trying to think of what else I can, I can add to that. Sure, sure. So the batteries, um, one of the really cool, we're gonna use Tesla batteries on this project. And one of the cool things that, uh, about these Tesla batteries that, that people don't know is that the actual individual cell is a double A battery, but it's made out of lithium, lithium ion. So these, uh, these, these uh, big uh, containers are just collections of a lot of these little double uh, A cells. The same batteries that go into their cars the same batteries that are driving around and parking in your neighbor's lots are the, are the same battles that will be in here. And um, they're safe. Uh, I, there hasn't been a fire on Tesla batteries in the United States ever. And, and they, they tr actually had, the only fire they had on them was when they tried to turn, light it on fire. It took them a while to do it, but they got it to go. But there hasn't been a fire on the U.S. Uh, at 1.6 gigawatts of, of production. So um, it's... Mm, I guess what I want to talk about is my neighbors that are, that are around these panels and what, the, what their comments to me have been. And uh, overwhelmingly what they say to me is, you know what, I was worried about it, but then the panels went in and it's just quiet. There's no neighbors, there's no houses, there's no construction noise. And I, you know, because a lot of the places where you put the panels, the alternative was a housing development, especially on farms on the vineyard. The taxes are so high, these farms have to sell off pieces. And generally, they just sell them off to you know, housing developments. But we've been able to put in solar arrays instead. And everyone is a winner at that point because the land gets preserved as farmland. There's no houses on it that are permanent. And, um, and they're happy with them. I, you know, one of my neighbors on my biggest field lives like right in the front of the panels. And he couldn't be happier. He's like, I don't look at houses. It's quiet. So that, those are, that's kind of a real, real feedback from my different neighbors. Um, yeah, sure. Um, any questions about any of the process or what it's like to live near a solar array or concerns you might have? I'd be happy to try to, try to answer them. Sure. Well, um, Lightnings can strike these things, and if it does, it can, it's like hitting a regular electronics. They'll just turn off and stop working. 
and um, nothing particularly other than that. We've had lightning strikes in the vineyard, and what happens generally is that the circuits that are most vulnerable are the ones that break. In, our, in the case of, we have communication circuits, those are the ones that always go out when there's lightning. Um, but other than that, we fix a few uh, small Cat5 wires, and the thing's backing up and running in a day. Sure. Uh, construction, um, I'm sorry? Yep. Yeah. Well, sure, sure. The, the, big, the biggest trucks that'll come in there will be um, the utility trucks, which are already there to maintain the, the telephone poles. And there'll be a crane that'll come in once to lift the, um, the batteries into place. Other than that, we're going to have pickup trucks and uh, flatbeds. There'll be a backhoe down there and a forklift, but there's no giant trucks. Um, all those panels come on pallets, on flatbeds, so they come in. They're not that heavy, and a, you know, a regular forklift takes them off. But like I say, the, the majority of the vehicles that are big will be utility company vehicles that are already there maintaining the, the telephone poles. Anybody else? Sure. Um, that's a question, I mean, the trees have to be removed where the panels are. As far as the perimeter goes, I can't answer that question. So if we look at the existing, this is the existing conditions, as you know, it, other than the fact that these buildings are gone, but the edge of the paved or developed area of the site is, is this, maybe half the, just under half the site, this lower quadrant, maybe about a third of the site is developed. This will require us to come into this wooded area here. As I indicated, there's a lot of debris in here, but you can see it's, it's a, a mix of vegetation. It's treed and, and undeveloped uh, here, and it is developed here. But yes, there will be trees removed as, as part of the project. There will be no well and resource areas touched. We did do a delineation that's off-site in these areas here. So it's wetlands down below here, wetlands over here to the east. And we did go to the Conservation Commission because this is a buffer zone project. We're within 100 feet of a wetland, and that requires us to get a permit from conservation. And as, again, as Attorney Burke indicated, we've already gone through that process. And they've looked at the impact of clearing the trees and changing the grades and changing the, the cover type or the type of surface that's here from a mix of impervious surface and pervious to a predominantly, imper a predominantly pervious surface. So all of that's been reviewed from that standpoint, and we do have a permit allowing that activity to begin. So looking at, because this, this may be a little more difficult, it's a little more uh, cluttered. The battery is, proposed to be situated right here. And on, just so you have an idea of scale, this plan is one inch equals um, 40 feet. So 40, 80, the closest residential property, the closest house would probably be a little over 120 feet away from the closest point on the battery. Up the hill, through the fence, through the vegetation, and then that total distance to the nearest residence would be about 120 feet or so. Okay, thank you. One last question. What exactly does the city of Brockton get out of this? I can help that. Uh, what they do is they require pilot agreements uh, in lieu of taxation because there's a whole question of whether this is manufacturing of electricity. To get around that, the Department of Revenue entered into a program with the municipalities and towns uh, a number of years ago. So what will happen is the developer will sit down with the assessor and city solicitor, and then they will hire out basically an agreement that's in lieu of taxes, and they'll pay a certain amount of money based on the type of project, the size of the project, uh, and, and, and it's reasonably lucrative for the municipality. 
but does Brockton get all the electricity? It goes no. into the but grid. Do we have to share it with other towns. It goes into the grid. It goes right into the grid. Mm -hmm. and, and the grid goes wherever the grid goes. Mm -hmm. Stephanie. So my first, I don't need that. Okay. No, you don't. <laughs> I think they need it for the cable. Okay, I, I forgot about that. Okay, um, so my first question, I would like to go back to the buffer between the property line of the residential property and the distance to the panels. So from all of the surrounding parcels, what is the distance between the property line and the panels? Uh, I'm not going to guess, so let me just put the scale on here. There is a 30-foot mandatory setback. So from the boundary line to the closest panel, there is a mandatory requirement under the zoning for a 30-foot setback. And all of the modules would be set more than 30 feet away. But that is represented by this dashed line on the plan. That Wait, is the you... zoning setback line. OK, which of course we can't see from here. Um, so that is the zoning setback for any structure. Correct. It's not specific to solar panels. That's because correct. some communities have a 100-foot buffer from the property line, not from a structure, not from a residential dwelling, but to the panels. And what kind of planting material are you going to place? Because you are removing a substantial amount of vegetation. So what kind of plantings, you talked about um, having your landscape architect talk about yes. plant material for the front, but what about buffering between the residential properties well, that's, and, and the other properties? That, well, I mean, that's, it looks like a significant portion of it is undeveloped land. Some of it is owned by the city and um, some of it is owned privately. Right. So what Stephanie did was she focused on the areas closest to the residential properties and these, and again, I know it's very difficult to see, it's, it's tough to, to present in a room of this size, but there are plantings scattered in this area here and entirely along the frontage. And that's where um, we have, at least at this point in time, focused the plantings. Uh, it's a mix of evergreens and plants that are native to the area. Um, Stephanie, again, is a registered professional landscape architect. And again, she has worked on solar projects to, to pick a mix of plants and, and trees and shrubs that will provide an effective buffering, be attractive along the perimeter. Um, and that's why we set those plantings outside of the fenced area so that they are between the fenced enclosure and the abutting uh, residential properties. Okay, so there are. And outside. there's a listing of plants on the plants that were approved by conservation. Um, I don't have that listing, and frankly, I'm not a a landscape architect, so I wouldn't even be able to describe what they are to you. Okay, so then my next question is about noise. I understand that the equipment, and you talked about the cooling fans, and you said noise, um, but they do make a humming sound that can be disturbing to people in the neighborhood. Let me address that um, with an example from Martha's Vineyard. Uh, the town decided that they were going to put a solar array in Egertown. And um, this was back when nobody knew anything about solar, but it was a good, they thought it was a good idea, which they did. And they put in these things called uh, central inverters, big boxes, probably as big as a, like a work van. And those do make a hum for sure. And so um, to fix that, they took those big boxes out and put small boxes like we're doing on this one. And the boxes we're putting in, it's called distributed inverting. So rather than one big inverter, which does make a hum, you have um, 33 uh, small inverters that are made to go in people's houses that have a computer fan in them. And you, honestly, you can't hear them at all. Um, and we have Tesla batteries on the vineyard. These Tesla batteries, I've never heard the Tesla batteries make any noise. So um, I know there's a lot of, of thoughts about, you know, this is gonna be loud. And if it were central inverters, that would be the case. But because we've chosen these distributed inverters, which are much smaller and made to be in people's houses, the noises are, are you know, if you're standing on the street or adjacent to the property, you're not going to hear a thing. Okay, thank you. And one final question. You talked about the fact that your 
removing impervious surface that currently exists on the site and that you will be, um, I'm, I'm guessing, I don't know if you said, but you're going to be bringing in some uh, soils and planting with the pollinator species. But you are still subject to stormwater regulations and reviews and rates of runoff and um, the velocity which can flow off. So uh, do you have a stormwater management plan? Yes. As part of our review with conservation, we, we did have to develop a stormwater plan. It was peer reviewed by an independent engineer. So when we go through these types of projects, the communities typically don't just take our word for things. They, they retain at the applicant's expense an independent engineer. That occurred in this case. Um, the independent engineer looked at our drainage analysis to make sure, as um, Ms. Danielson indicated, runoff develops off any piece of property and it flows in a certain pattern. We're obligated not to increase that runoff. We're also obligated to make sure it's not dirty water leaving the site. And we're obligated to make sure we're not going to have a negative impact on surrounding properties, particularly down gradient properties. So we have to maintain the basic drainage pattern. So right now the basic drainage pattern is towards the middle of the site and then from north to south. When we're done, the drainage pattern will be towards the middle of the site and north to south. Excuse me. There's an existing collection system. We're actually going to put in uh, something called a flow guard system, which will create sediment oil, <coughs> excuse me, screening. We typically use it on larger commercial sites. We've used it for a number of Rockland Trust banks that we've done uh, design work for because they work really effectively. They're low maintenance, especially in a site where we're not bringing in sand, we're not sanding roads, we're not generating a lot of sediment off this site once it's completely developed. But it is an effective screen and it will screen the water going down gradient and it's replacing an old industrial discharge essentially that had no screening effectively. And we've looked at the drainage piping, it's in pretty tough shape, it needs cleaning. One of the conditions that we are obligated to do is clean, inspect and clean that drainage system, add some new structures, add these flow guard units and that's part of our stormwater management program that we do have uh, implemented for, for this site. Are there any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, and I, we've observed that. Our, our survey folks and wetlands people observe that as well. The entire perimeter does have a seven-foot fence. Um, and we know that people get through fences over time, but there will be periodic inspections of the fence perimeter. Um, there is remote monitoring of all the equipment. So as uh, Mr. Bennett indicated, everything gets telemetry back to the owners. The owners can see how the system's working. If someone comes in and tampers with something, there is a, a mechanism by which they will know that they know something's not working right for some reason, and it would prompt a uh, inspection of the facility. The gated entrance is secured. The only access is by the owners or emergency personnel from the fire department or police department if they felt they needed to come in. The police needed to come in at any point in time to uh, inspect. They will have access to the Knox box, and that would allow them 24-hour um, access uh, to the site in a controlled fashion. There's no lighting, again, we're trying to keep this low key so we don't put lighting on a project of this type, typically. Um, usually when we go to before boards and neighborhoods, the, the first concern is we don't want lighting on a site of this type. Um, so it is, again, it's gonna be a, a learning process for the owners, how much um, monitoring of security issues they're going to have to do as time goes on, but we know it's a, it's a bit of an issue here, but we hope this cleans up some of those uh, vagrant issues that you have experienced. I, I think you had a question? I, I do. Oh, sorry. Um, my name is Clarissa. I have actually happened to own one of the properties that lines up with the dump um, current site. Um, and I understand that you said that you guys would be essentially updating the current system that's there um, that I understand is not equipped to handle today's amount of rain. Um, that's great to hear. 
Um, but how can I expect the solar panels to uh, affect my property? Because I understand that that would most likely um, cause de decreased absorption. And at this time, I actually suffer from having a marsh in my yard. And um, actually, my house is almost totaled as a result of all the backflow that comes and the water leaching that comes from the dump site. So your, your property is up in this corner here? Um, me and my four neighbors are the four that are affected. Um, okay. and we actually lined the, the fence that's there now. Yep. All of our properties line up Yeah, we've that. seen the water bleeding out of this area, and we know that there's some water that bleeds. There's an old, old, there's a detention basin for this facility here that bleeds onto this site. And then it kind of pockets on the slope a little bit and then seeps down. One of the things we're doing is, and this came out of the Independent Engineers Review, is we're providing a stone line channel that is going to force the water from these properties, so from your backyard area, force the water to travel in a more focused fashion to this middle section. And because we're trying not to create erosion, we've got a stone line channel coming down, and it's gonna lead right to the drainage system. There's a series of catch basins that'll occur down in this lower section of the site. And this is probably, going to be 10 feet or so below your property. So that is going to ensure that none of the work we're doing is going to berm the water up or prevent your land from draining this way. It'll actually make that drainage off this slope a little more robust so that it does get where we want it to get. So are you telling me that I can expect for my 1.54 acres to dry up? Because essentially right now it's, it's not. So I'm, I'm yeah, very I, curious. I, I, yeah, I can't predict. I don't know what your specific land problems may be. You may have a soil issue or the grade on your lot may not be steep enough. So it may cause that puddling. I, without looking at your lot, I wouldn't want to yeah. rep represent something that I can't guarantee you. Yeah, because so the I, trees I are all falling down at the, um, at the fence that's there for the city. I have seven of them actually that are 100% uprooted. So I'm quite curious. Um, I also want to know how can all this, how can my neighbors and I expect all this um, construction to affect us? Because obviously there's going to be some kind of impediment as far as on our land in order to rectify, you know, the issue that you guys have with the fence, which is in many areas, it's just down, it's destroyed um, by the trees that have fallen and the other issues. Like how, sure. what can we expect? So, again, construction is a temporary impact, obviously. We're, we're, and I think, um, I don't know if anybody mentioned this, when the construction equipment is brought to the site, it'll be brought in, unloaded, and it'll stay here until those activities that that equipment is needed for is completed. So that's going to keep the wear and tear on the road down compared to if this were a residential development and you were building houses over time, you'd see two years worth of construction and construction equipment constantly coming in and leaving the area to complete a subdivision of this type, typically. I mean, we've, we've been involved in a lot of residential projects and the market fluctuates, and as the market fluctuates, the construction tends to stretch out a bit. So this is a much shorter duration construction operation than you might normally see if this were being developed commercially or residentially, and we think that that's the impact. So I'm not going to tell you there's not going to be a construction impact. One thing that does happen in the permitting process, and I'm sure this will happen through the special permit, is there will be hours of construction that will be dictated um, as part of that permit. And that will be something that will get agreed to, and the applicant will be bound by that. So they wouldn't be able to start construction before a certain time, work after a certain time. There may be days of the week limitations. So those are things that when we get into the public hearing process, it typically get flushed out in terms of concerns of the neighborhood and get worked into the actual permit. Mm. So we, do you think that we can expect probably a um, less than average or about average impact? I mean, the, the rain seems to be a very big concern of mine. I'm not sure how my neighbors feel. Um, mm -hmm. Just because I'm just trying to understand the actual effect that it will have on the current system, the new system, and if there is increased rain um, over the next 10 years, what would we expect? Because I know currently that's a big issue. So when we do the drainage design, there are computer models we use, and they're based on um, historical rainfall data for the region. So we look at the region we're working in, and we look at a number of storms. We start with the day-to-day -day storms. 
what they call a two-year storm, and that's about three and a half inches of rainfall in a day. And we work all the way up to the 100-year storm event, which is a little over seven inches of rainfall, I believe, in this area, in a 24-hour um, period. So if we were to get seven inches of rainfall in a 24-hour period, we have done the computer models to show that this project will not, first of all, dam up water and negatively impact you, or send more water downhill than what occurs today. So there's a balance that we do with the analysis. It's a very standard analysis. Um, and again, the, the city's engineer who was retained during the conservation process confirmed that our analysis and the methodology we used and the assumptions we made were valid assumptions using good engineering practice. And so that's your assurance that this is going to, and frankly, this will actually result in less runoff because with the pollinator mix, what happens is the runoff hits the panels, drops along the drip edge, which is the southern edge of the panels, and essentially seeps into the ground. So we're not focusing flow like you do in a parking lot or from a, a series of houses and driveways. You're, you're dispersing the flow throughout the entire site and not really focusing it. But when you get the heavy rain, we do want it to collect here and then discharge. So it's a balance and we've made that balance in the analysis. Where is the water actually discharging? Because I know right now they said it's just staying underground. Yep, there's a, there's a series of catch basins that have served the industrial project. They're, they're located, actually, there were a couple of them here. The pipe actually ran underneath the building and then it continues on under the sewer line. There's a, the city sewer line like right here that traverses the woods just south of the site. And then it continues on down and it, and it discharges into the wetlands down here. That will continue because that's the, the existing flow. It's probably been there for over 100 years. And it's now going to get an upgrade from a water quality and a pipe cleaning standpoint. So we think the system will work much better than it probably has in recent memory. And it, it would expect it, let's say, the average rainfall increases over the next 10 years. It would be expected to be able to uh, with, withstand that whole situation? We have, we have found, and I've, I've been doing drainage design for, unfortunately, about 40 years. Um, we have found that the methodology and the models are pretty conservative in how they model the runoff. So in this case, we've modeled the runoff and demonstrated that there'll actually be a net decrease in the peak rate of water leaving the site, and that's going to continue with our analysis here in that we are demonstrating there will be a reduction in that peak rate of runoff leaving the site. And I, and I believe really it's a con very conservative analysis. Okay. I only asked because I was told that when it was put in, it wasn't calculating in any possible increases in rain. So that's why I, I thought that was quite important to ask. Sure. And, and again, I know you, you, you indicated you may have a specific problem here. Um, you know, we'll be going to this site over the next, the next few weeks and months. Um, if it's something you're interested in, I don't have a problem coming by next time in the area if it's convenient and, and just taking a look at your specific problem and just see if, if there's what your specific issue may be. Not that we can necessarily solve it, but be happy to take a look at it just to make sure we don't uh, exacerbate your, your issue. Well, myself and my four neighbors are definitely more than open to that. Okay. Um, Unfortunately, a few of my neighbors weren't able to make it, and um, we definitely would like that. So before we go tonight, if you have your contact information, I'll give you my I'll give you my business card before we leave, and, and you, yeah, and I can share some photos with you as well. Okay. Yeah. I can also put together a meeting with Clarissa and her neighbors. Perhaps Stephanie will come, and all of you. Perfect. Okay. Sign in. Okay. Um, okay. One more question, and then I have to move on. We are going in December. When are you planning to go to the Sony Board of Appeals? We're going in December. Thank you. And do you have to go for site plan review before the planning board? It's, a, it's an entirely new process in the city. I handled the first permit up at Thorny Lee that you may be familiar with. Uh, basically, uh, there is no requirement uh, to go to site plan review. But we are uh, voluntarily going to go to site plan review with the planning board. Uh, that's the uh, understanding we made with the city. Okay. Um, I have a question for Mr. Ingargiola about dead birds. What are you going to do about the birds that are harmed 
in the panels. Yes. I've never seen a dead bird on any of our fields. Um, you know, when I, I have uh, wired some glass houses and put panels on the roof, and I've seen devastating effects on birds when they hit the glass of the house, but never on a panel, ever. never seen one. Gentlemen, I want to thank you for this presentation. Leave your cards, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, at this time, I would like to recognize some city officials who are here in addition to our speakers. Councilor at Large Winthrop Farwell and Councilor at Large Rita Mendez have joined us. Also, Brockton Democratic City Committee Chair Deborah Garland is here and the, the Democratic Committee's Affirmative Action Advisor, Janice Johnson Plumer, is here. And I'm grateful for all of you. Okay, at this time I would like to invite up Mayor Sullivan, Chief Nardelli, Chief Gomes, and um, Mr. Rodriguez. Okay, I'm going to ask Mayor Sullivan to begin. He's a busy guy. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. I, uh, first of all, I want to thank Councilman Castro for hosting this tonight. Um, I'm fully vaccinated, so if nobody objects, I'm just going to take this off right now. Thank you. Um, hi, hi, Tony. Um, so let me just give you a quick rundown on what's been going on. Um, you know, I came into office, as you know, January 6, 2020, right? And COVID wasn't even here on the West Coast yet. But it's here and it's real. And as I stand here, we've lost 444 residents to COVID-19. So um, we're going to continue to be diligent and vigilant. We have to. Um, 16,000 cases in the city. So I have some good news tonight, though. The state has designated the Shaw Center as a regional booster site. It comes in effect next Tuesday. So that's, that is good news. That is really good news. Um, took a little while, but we finally got it done. Um, the other thing I want to tell you is one thing I decided not to do as mayor is I did not pause construction. Um, every Sunday night I did a call with 12 mayors throughout the state and most of them paused construction. And when they got to me, they're like, Bob, are you going to stop it in Brockton? I said, no, we can't. We, we can't. The train is going down the track. You know, we're going to do it in a safe way. And if you go downtown Brockton, I mean, I grew up, grew up here. My wife grew up here. If, if you went downtown Brockton right now, it's probably the largest construction projects going on right now. Now, Mayor, the late Mayor Bill Carpenter, and Mayor Balzotti, Mayor Harrington, a lot of them had done some work that you know, we're benefiting from, but I will tell you that the city council uh, adopted Chapter 40R, which is smart growth zoning, um, back when I was on the council. And that truly has changed downtown. When Trinity Financial from Boston invested $30 million in downtown where the old enterprise used to be, People probably thought they were crazy, right? But they're doing phase two right now. And when you look at where Kresge's used to be, you know, on the corner of what used to be High Street, Frederick Douglass now in Maine, that's gonna be the first um, black-owned brew pub in the whole Commonwealth of Massachusetts called um, Brockton Beer Company. And there's high-end apartments above that. Now, we can talk about downtown, um, but I'm in Ward 4, so we need to talk about what's going on around here as well, because what I say to every developer that comes to meet with me, and I meet with everybody, I mean, that's what it means to be a mayor. You have to listen and learn. Um, you know, I keep saying if Brockton was a stock, we, we should all be investing in Brockton um, because of the transit-oriented. The fact that we have three commuter stops in Brockton, the fact that the price point compared to Quincy and Braintree and Dorchester and Southie, people are moving to Brockton. They are. That's a fact. But a lot of them are then getting on the train and going into Boston. So the goal is you want to live and work in the city. So um, last week, Councilman Castro and I went to go see uh, Mr. Gilson, who owns Washburn Candy. Washburn Candy uh, is the oldest family-owned candy company in the nation. It beats Hershey, um, which is amazing in itself, right? But they are actually going to be selling. Um, they're, they're, they're tired. The next generation doesn't want to pick it up. So 
Councilor and I wanted to have a sit down um, with Mr. Gilson to see exactly what the plans are because that place is mammoth. And so he is gonna be selling it to a, uh, a hedge fund, an investment firm. Um, but the promise right now is that they're gonna continue, he's gonna stay on for a while too, um, to make candy there. They're gonna be making candy there, but then they're also gonna utilize the square footage, the mag, you know, the mammoth building uh, for other business endeavors. Um, the thought is they'll do cold storage because they already have cold storage in the bottom where they have the sugar and the molasses for the candy. Just today, Councilman Castro and I spoke to Mr. Dropkin, uh, Steve Dropkin, who owns Kmart Plaza. I met a guy from Manhattan. He came to meet with me. Uh, he's in the film industry. And uh, he said, Mayor, I want to buy Kmart Plaza. And it was exciting because, as you all know, specifically down here, Brockton is on the radar of Hollywood. We have an AMC two-year series being made here. Netflix came here. Next weekend at City Hall, they're doing a filming of a, a Whitney Houston, the late singer Whitney Houston in Brockton. And then next month, they're gonna do another movie about the Boston Strangler here and they're filming in Brockton. Good thing about that, though, is, is Brockton gets paid. We get paid, the parking authority gets paid, and they use, uh, they use businesses. Gus at the Italian Kitchen is, is jumping for joy because they all go in there to eat lunch. But what, what I was excited about is this gentleman from Manhattan was gonna acquire the Kmart Plaza, which is long overdue, and it's used and it's tired, and he was gonna make a film studio there, a production studio. Um, it sounded awesome, it really did. It's gonna help our tax base, it's gonna be creating about 400 jobs. Um, but that hasn't happened yet, so Councilor and I wanted to see if there was a way to figure out what's going on. It seems like, unfortunately, that deal is gonna die. It seems like the buyer and seller just aren't gonna be able to come to fruition on that, which is disappointing. But both Susan and I made it clear to Mr. Dropkin that we need to get some more life into that part of the, part of the city. It needs to happen. And they seem to be pretty ready, willing, and able to work with us. Um, the fact is that you know people are investing in Brockton, but one thing that I think we need to look at as Brocktonians is how we really create Brockton as a business. And what I mean by that is that Brockton is a business. It's, we're in the people business. It's a $500 million business known as the city of Brockton. So when you see the news about Brockton on Fox or Channel 7 or 5, it's always the bad stuff, right? They don't talk about the six kids that graduated from Brockton High that went to Ivy League last year. They don't talk about that stuff. And then the local newspaper is not necessarily the Brockton Enterprise that I was a paper boy for you, I'll, I'll tell you that, it's not. Um, we, we had a historic thing this year happen in Brockton where our budget, the city budget that we do every year, got recognized, we got a national award. They said it was, it was a, a really excellent budget. Only four municipalities in the Commonwealth got it. Brockton was the only city. That's pretty newsworthy. When I sent the information to the Brockton Enterprise, they said, it's not newsworthy. Our readers aren't gonna really care about that. But you know what it was printed? It was printed in the Falmouth Enterprise down the Cape. They thought it was newsworthy. So um, what I'm saying today is, uh, you know, I, I, I feel being mayor is an honor and a privilege. It really is. I, I enjoy the job. People say to me, why the hell are you running again? You've been dealing with a pandemic pretty much since day one. Brockton's home. It's your home, it's our home, it's my home. We, we need to have a clean home. The city's dirty. I talk to the DPW commission every morning. Get the street sweepers out, it looks like hell. I take pictures. We gotta do a better job doing that. But we, we also have to make sure that quality of life issues are addressed. They have to be. We're all taxpayers, I'm a taxpayer. I think some people think I'm not, but I am. Uh, and we expect certain things in Brockton. So we wanna have a safe community. I do want to say that, thankful to all the councilors, all 11 councilors, we will be having a new public safety building, um, the old Brockton High School. It will be, it's not a new fire station or a new police station, it's a public safety building where information technology will be there, police will be there, fire will be there, and then BEMA, Brockton Emergency Management, which is based at the War Memorial. Now what's important about that, first of all, other than you know, getting a, a state-of-the-art building that Brockton deserves that's gonna be conducive to the professionals that work there. It's also gonna free up space at Brockton High because right now IT is based, if you went to Brockton High, it's up in the core and it's gonna be more free of space. Now, I have three kids. Um, two of my kids go to Brockton Public Schools. My other son goes to a Catholic school. But um, there's been, I was just talk, this, talking to Superintendent Thomas, that's why I was in the back. 
there's a lot going on, right? There's a lot going on, and there's fights, and there's this crazy thing called TikTok where kids are breaking things, and at Oliver Ames, they rip the urinal out of the wall, and they rip the sink out of uh, one of the junior middle, middle schools here. So I said to Mike, I've known Mike Thomas since we were at Brockton High together. Um, I said, Mike, what's going on? Like, what's going on? And Janice would know this as well. And so he said it like this, and it made me think. The current ninth grade freshmen at Brockton High, the last time they were in school full time, there were sixth graders. I hadn't thought of that, and you think about it, you know, sixth grade to ninth grade is a hell of a jump. So we're having some issues. Um, a week ago Friday, we had an individual bring a gun to, to school, bring a gun uh, to school. Um, we keep preaching, um, if you see something, say something, and it worked because two brave students spoke up, and uh, thankfully we had the school police there. And I remember when I was a student at Brockton High in the 80s, people thought, why does Brockton need a school police? I'm very thankful there was a school police officer there to make sure that it was done in a calm, professional manner. And that individual is gonna be getting help. Um, that individual definitely needs help. But also, um, you know, one thing that I just wanna let you know that I can speak for uh, Councilman Castro, and I see the council presidents here, and Councilman Mendez. We're better together. We have to work together. There's an expectation that only people that live in Brockton understand. Brockton's a special place. I was at New Heights, Heights uh, Crossing today, you know, the assisted living up on Christie's near the highway, and uh, it's the 25th anniversary. I went in there, it was about 85 seniors looking at me and talking to me about how they remember Brockton and how proud they are that they still live in Brockton. And that speaks to my heart. So the fact that I pulled in here tonight, and when Paul Stadinsky was the counselor, we may, maybe had 10 people here at times, and Stud's a friend of mine, but this place was packed. So that speaks volumes because you could be home watching the Sox losing 6-0 right now. But you're not, you're here because you care, yeah, it was 6-0 a little while ago. Um, you care about Brockton. And I also wanna just say that, um, you know, these individuals here, Tony Rodriguez has become a really good friend of mine on the school committee. He's a dedicated servant. And again, you have Chief Manny Gomes, 36 years on the job. You got Brian Nardelli, who's the new chief, but he's 25 years on the job. These people care about Brockton, and I care about Brockton, and I just want to thank you. I'm here to answer any questions tonight, but let's continue to be safe, okay? Yes, sir. First thing, the day before the Black Lives Matter riot in Brockton, I ran into Chief, I ran into Chief uh, Gomes at the Italian kitchen, and I said, good luck with, through all this, and he goes, don't worry, we have it handled. Um, Chief Manny did Brockton such an honor for what him and his police officers did that night. If anybody saw the video, two, two of his officers went into that Dunkin' Donuts and put the fire out, okay? The fire chief took over Chief Galligan's job and I have many, many friends on the fire department, and they really love this guy. So there must be something there that nobody else sees or looks for. And I feel as though Brockton is in such good hands, even with you, Mr. Mayor, okay? You, know, you weren't just a throw in for the soup, okay? You, you know, Mr. Mayor Carpenter, put his soul into this place, and you just picked right up where he left. Thank you. I don't know anybody from the school committee, sorry. <laughs> no, so, so thank you to say those things, and I'm gonna let these people speak for themselves, but um, if I could just say one thing uh, relative to that night uh, a year ago, June. Um, we planned uh, all these people. Brian was there, Chief Williams, um, DPW, schools. Mike Thomas was there and Dr. Cobbs. We said um, about three days before that incident that we're going to plan for the worst, hope for the best, but we're going to have a plan and we're going to execute the plan. I'm not law enforcement. I'm not fire. I'm, I'm just uh, a guy that loves the city. And it was executed, and it could have gone sideways. People could have got killed. It could have gone sideways. Now, what I will say also, though, is... Um, when I went to the burned out Dunkin' Donuts the next morning and I was interviewed, I said, what happened last night is not the reflection of the city I grew up in. 
but what's happening right now, look across the street, and there was people, white, black, young, old, cleaning Montello Street. That's the Brockton I know, and so thank you for saying that. Brian's next. See if we end up in the right spots at the end. <laughs> Good evening, everyone, and thank you for the kind words. Uh, my name is Brian Nardelli. Um, I've been on the fire department now 25 years. I'll be 26 years in next month, actually. Um, I just took over in July. Um, I'm, I've had a long line of great chiefs before me. Um, I, I really find it to be an honor to serve this city every day. Um, I love this city, born and raised. I've actually never left this city. Didn't even move out to go to college. Um, but I, you know, my hometown sweetheart, I married, lives in this city um, that I love dearly. I raised my three kids in this city. Um, I love protecting the residents of the city. Um, one of the things I think is important for all of you to realize, the Brockton Fire Department's strong and, and, and there for you at any moment. Um, and I, I hope you all understand that. Um, the greatest thing that drew me to the fire service, I think, as a kid um, was the fact that when the fire department was called, they just showed up. No questions asked. One of the first phone, one of the first calls I went on as a new firefighter, we went to a call for a woman who had a difficult time with her thermostat. And I walked in, I said, all that training? This is what I'm doing? You have no idea the smile on that woman's face when we left. Giving us food, hugging us, kissing us. I felt like I was at my grandmother's house. But that's, that's what we want. That's, that, I, I, I tell you, is, and, and I think a lot of you who are, who, are, who are born and raised here, and if you're not, if you're new to the city, one of the interesting things about the city of Brockton is when you're in the city, it's a, it's a, it's a city with a small town feel. Everybody knows everybody. Everybody wants to be around everybody. Um, look at me, 49 years old. I haven't left the city once. Um, to give you a little background on what's going on in the department, some, some good things we got going on. This is difficult because I move around a lot, but I know cables here, so I have to be very careful. I do this at the city council meeting. I stand there and try to plant my feet. Um, things going on in the Brockton Fire Department, if you've been watching, we just um, were able to appoint uh, 14 new members, um, seven new positions. Um, if everyone who's been in the city long enough knows the devastation that happened in the schools and the fire department and the police department back in the early 90s, 1991, um, we actually lost a company out of commission. I know, I know Chief Gomes is still trying to work his way back from that as well. So we're tr we've built back quite a bit, and, and with the dedication of the mayor, um, the chief financial officer, and the city council the other night, we were able to add seven new positions, which was really nice to be able to see, because we had seven positions through attrition, through retirements, and we were able to add seven more. We're still down one of our pieces of apparatus that eventually, in speaking with the mayor, we're trying to get that back. So 14 new recruits, if you see them running around the city with their bright yellow vests on, please don't hit them. I need them. Um, but not only that, um, we, uh, the, the mayor brought up real quick about the public safety facility. We're working hard on, in working on that. Um, it's a big project. It's nothing that I don't think anyone in the Brockton Fire Department has dealt with in the, in, in, that's currently on the department. The um, stations um, on Cary Hill, um, the west side, and the east side are, 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 were built in the 1960s. So no one that was on the job is actually was involved in the design of those. So this is a big undertaking. One of the great things about this project, and I know um, Chief Gomes and, and the mayor can speak on, is the efficiency of it. Um, what we did, if you, if you were to go to the Brockton Fire Department today and you need a permit, for a smoke inspection. You called, you did it online. You might have to deal with the Fire Prevention Bureau that's downtown, but if you needed something from the Chief's office, you have to come up to the west side where headquarters is. Um, different things like that makes a big difference. Now you're traveling all over the city. Um, what this will do, this will bring all of that downtown, and I think Chief Gomes feels that way too. IT, we, with the police department and us, IT is a major crucial part of our 911 system and our um, computer-assisted dispatching system. So, Bringing that all into one place now, where we all are operating on the same generators and all those different things, it, it, it helps the tax dollars for the city as well, and the efficiency in making sure we're all in one place under one roof. Um, we've had great working relationships with all four city departments that are working on it. Um, we're looking to, um, we're looking, you know, it's, it's moving forward. We're still in design. I, I, I guess I had, I've had friends of mine around the Commonwealth who have actually been involved in these projects, and they talk about it's a daunting process. and, and 
And um, President Farwell's on the committee, and we meet every other Monday morning in our big group, and I think he could speak to that too. There's a lot of moving parts. So I, I think we're all learning, we're getting there, we have some great advisors, we have a great um, owner's project manager that's making sure we're steering in the right direction um, along with our, with our city leaders. So um, last year, you might have seen, we were actually able to take, um, take on three new engine companies, companies in the city. Um, Brockton, the Brockton Fire Department responds on approximately 30,000 runs 30,000 responses a year distributed throughout the city. Now, some stations are busier than others, obviously, but we received an um, assistance to firefighter grant from FEMA. And when we did that, we, we, we were gonna go before to accept it, but we, hadn't, we, hadn't we actually hadn't received the grant yet. And um, the mayor, when he was the uh, council president, actually made a commitment to the fire department and with, along with the councilors and, and at the time that if we were able to do this, let's be able to put the money forward because we needed two more at the same time. And um, that all came to fruition. We were able to bond out those engine companies. They're state of the art. They were delivered from Pierce Manufacturing Company back approximately a year ago now. Um, they're in service, one up on Cary Hill, one on the east side at Station 4, and one um, over on the west side next to the high school. Um, state of the art equipment. Um, Right now, we have an AF, we've received another AFG grant, which is nice to replace the tactical support unit downtown. It's, it's gonna be a heavy rescue unit. Um, that we're gonna be able to take, and we have five pieces of equipment that hold different, different pieces of equipment, five pieces of apparatus that hold all of our technical rescue equipment, which, be, which is a growing aspect of our job. And we're able to now take them, we're gonna be able to put them all in one piece of apparatus, which will be nice. We won't have to have people coming from different directions. Um, a lot of that all going on now, like I said, the recruits. Um, this week is a special week. Um, we were able to host, if any of you are up on the north side of the city around the Howard School, you'll see a lot of activity. It's one of the buildings we use for our drill schools. But one of the things that this week, um, the International Association of Firefighters is going, is out here now teaching a class on firefighter survivability. Um, we work so much on moving and getting people out of buildings. Like we had a fire on Wellington Street yesterday, they were able to get people out of the building. But we never focus on if things go bad, how are we gonna get ourselves out? And that's what this survivability class is about. And um, we, have, we have instructors there, for a captain from LA County, we have a, um, a, a lieutenant from British Columbia. He had a little bit of a ride. Um, it's warmer here though now, that's what he told me. That's what he told me. I said, I think it's warmer here any time of year. Um, but, but, but that class is ongoing up at the Howard School um, and that will be concluding tomorrow. And it's, it's, what's great about it is it's a train the train a program. When they asked if we could host it, I asked how many of my own people I could get in it because they take people from surrounding towns as well when they do it regionally. And um, we were able to get eight of our own personnel in it uh, in a class of about 26. So that's a, I think that's a good number for the city of Brockton. So all those good things are going on. Um, I think um, you know the Brockton Fire Department's strong. I think you know we love adding new blood, and I, I mentioned this in front of the City Council last week. I, we're an industry where we love seeing new, young bodies coming into the department. This is a young man's job, and, and it's very physical and very demanding at times. So it's great to have new people, um, and we look forward to the, them getting through their training. And hopefully, the midwinter we're going to get them on the fire apparatus and hopefully bolster our numbers a little bit more. So again, thank you for having me tonight. I'd be more than happy to take. Any questions, if anyone has anything? Yes. I don't have a question. I'd just like to give a compliment. I live on Coral Street, and the other night there was a serious accident in front of the Bay Center. Sure. Between the fire department, the police department, and the ambulance, you guys did an excellent job. Well, thank you. Um, I've been living in the city for five years now. I've seen some of the work you guys do, and it's awesome. I watched that stuff on TV, the riots and everything. And the way you handle stuff here is amazing. I appreciate it. I know, I know one of the great things is that people hold themselves to a level of professionalism to always be professional. And um, I, that, that accident, um, I was actually communicating with the mayor uh, while that was going on. I wasn't personally there, but um, that person, they had to use a couple of sets of jaws to get them out, um, to, to extricate them out. Um, uh, people train on that all the time. I, I, I'll tell you, Roy Andrade up at Everett's Auto Parts sees us coming. He knows he's losing money because he's always <laughs> donating vehicles for us to cut a pot. We, let, we save some pieces for him to sell afterwards, though. So. That's great to hear. Thank you. I appreciate it. We have a great partnership with Brewster Ambulance, who, who works real well with us. Yep. By the way, the person that told me that you be a wonderful chief was Archie Gomez. Archie, one of my very good friends. The best. Took me under his wing when I was 18 years old, like President Farwell. <laughs> well, you, you, you had that big gra graduation class from 86, all retired at the same time. We did. They just, they're just going out the door now. Some of them are still hanging on, but they're all going out. And I figured, oh, geez, the uh, 
that, that, that's a tough job for you, for you to fill. It is. It is. But we, you know, we have plenty. Well, the great thing is we have plenty of great candidates in the city. There's a lot of people. And I, I addressed the new class the other day at the end of the day, and I told them, fire service is like a calling. It's not a job. You're all, firefighters are always firefighters. Um, we just had a couple incidents over the summer. We had one of our guys in Bridgewater at a, pool, at, a, at a pool party. Kid went underwater, stopped breathing. They got the kid out, the little, young little girl. They were able to do CPR. They revived her and got her back. So firefighters are always firefighters. That's the great thing about So it's nice to live next to one. Well, I'm a nurse. Every there you time go. we have to dial 911, it's like a ballet. You know, guys coming in, going to the job. <laughs> Good. I appreciate it. I'm glad to say ballet, because we don't always feel like we're that graceful, but thank you. Yes. Chief, can you tell me if group homes are regulated for occupancy? I oh. live at 499 Copeland Street. Yep. We have a group home across the street from us that's a sober house. Yep. It's, been, it's been a couple of different things. There's an awful lot of people that live there, an awful lot of people. That, I, I know you're familiar with it. You're there all the time. What, did you, can you say the address one more time? It's 498 Copeland Street. Down by Brockton Country Club, correct? Yes. Down by St. Yes. Atlanta. So I'm directly across the street from it. Understood. Um, so, and I, and I, see, I see the police department there. I see the sheriff's department. I see the fire department. Understood. Uh, there is an awful lot of people in that house. So everything is regulated anytime like that. What I would suggest you would do, do you know uh, Deputy Chief Edward Williams? Yes. He's the fire prevention deputy. Yes. And, um, he is actually, um, I'll tell you right now, when he retires, um, he's got a few years left, thank goodness, but uh, he is an, uh, uh, such a great resource. He actually sits on, on committees that make these decisions throughout the Commonwealth. I so know. he would I, be more than happy to help you. So I had spoken to him did. a while ago, and he did try and get them to get sprinkler systems in, but apparently they're grandfathered. Unfortunately, we run into a lot of that with a lot of properties until they sell the property then things change, or they have a catastrophic fire, which we don't want to have. But they did sell the, this is what I don't understand. Did they? It went from a, um, a boy's home, which was owned by Green Tree Associates. Okay. And now it's owned by a gentleman who kind of, I think, just collects the rent. Um, some of those people are court mandated. Some of them are, um, I, I think, in there because they want to be in there, but Understood. some of them are there because they have to be there. Yep. There is uh, people that are in there, and they overdose, and they're, you know, I, we raise four children in this, like you, you know, I've been here for 60 years, yep. and we've been in our home for 40 years, so we have seen a lot of people come and go, yep. um, and we're still there, and we're hanging on, but it's really hard when we're being surrounded, we're being surrounded by drug dealers, they're dealing right on the street. On that property? Uh, right on the property, on the sidewalk, on the side streets, in the parking lots. The gentlemen across the street are picking up friends, we'll say, uh, women friends, and uh, visiting with them in the parking lot up the street. Uh, we have six grandchildren, and I keep a real tight eye on everybody across the street. Sure. But, you know, it's, it's, it's getting to be too much. I understand, yeah. I, 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 I would, and like I said, Deputy Chief Williams, I know, I will speak to him directly about, I can talk to you afterwards, I'll get your name. And that's exactly it. So he, what, a lot of these things, outside of just the sprinkler aspect of it, like you're saying, like every Thursday morning at nine o'clock, they have quality life. Deputy Williams uh, works with the mayor on that on a regular basis. And they go, they look into problems like this throughout the city. Um, that might be something that he could bring up. Um, but I'll talk to you afterwards you. about that as well. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, right here, Council. Hi. Hi. My husband was a firefighter who retired before you came on. Okay. But I would like to congratulate you. Thank you. And there's something I would like to, all the people here to know. Brockton has always been rated in this country as a Class A firefighter. Thank you. And that's something. Thank you. Who was your husband? Honor. Pardon who, me? Who was your husband? Who was your husband? Bob who? Jepson. Oh, sure. I know the name. I didn't know him, but I did know the no, name. No, he sure. retired about two years before you. Sure. Sure. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. That's, I'm, I'm, I'm glad she brought that up. Um, the, about four years ago now, um, the Brockton Fire Department actually gained a Class 1 um, ISO rating. There's only about four of those in the entire Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So that was a huge endeavor. That, and, and one of the things, that's not just the Brockton Fire Department, and I, 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 I say that 
and that's the important part. The class one designation, what is, what is looked into with that whole process is the 911 PSAP center that Chief uh, Gomes operates at the police station, the water supply system um, that the DPW has purview over, our training records, our response times, a number of different things like that. So, how, well, people can say, well, what does that mean? What is that, how does that help me? Well, that helps your insurance rates. So us, for us to be able to maintain a class one rating, um, all in all, will help your insurance rates. There's actuaries and a lot smarter people than I that figure those things out. But they actually do help your um, insurance ratings um, for your homeowner's insurance. Um, and it's, it's, it's more of a, for, I know in the fire service, it's a pride aspect that we have that, um, that uh, you know, us, Boston, Cambridge, um, I think Fall River just got it, but that's about it. There's very few. So, anything else? Great. Chief Gomes? We're moving down. We're moving down. Musical chairs again. We'll see where you end up at the end. <laughs> Hi, good evening. Uh, I see a lot of uh, familiar faces. But uh, for the ones I don't know and uh, that don't know me, I'm Manny Gomes. I'm the police chief. Um, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for those kind words. Uh, I want to tell you all that we've had some horrific times here uh, uh, in the city, especially with that situation. But the outpouring that the Brockton Police Department received from the residents and the merchants, I, I had to tell people to stop sending food to the station. These guys are getting too fat. I mean, we, we had pizza boxes that were higher than me at times. People, the kindness was amazing, the cards, the calls. Um, you, you don't see that, but we really became a community a lot tighter after that night. I just want to let you know that. And, you know, we, we, we practice for some of those things. You never know what you're going to get. But like the mayor says, you plan and you organize and you, and you have a plan and you prepare for the worst. Um, I was fortunate that um, nobody got seriously hurt. Uh, I had a couple of police officers that were, were burnt with fireworks. They, they have permanent scarring. I have one officer that lost part of his hearing because he was hit with a bottle rocket right in the side of the head, and others were hit with rocks. So there were, there were some injuries, but um, it, it was a good thing to move on from that. You know, and also, COVID has changed everything. It's changed everything in your life. It's changed everything in our lives. It's changed everything in the way a police department operates. I want you to know that, you know, the manpower that we have, Brockton's always run pretty thin. Um, I had 25% of the department actually test positive for COVID. If you think about it, we're the only government agency that during COVID, we have to bring people back to our house, mandated by law, okay? Um, we try to work around those things, but we did everything we could to shut down and be as clean and as positive as we could. We still had 25%, um, tell you rough numbers so you know, we, we have right around 198 officers, and I had 49 officers test positive. We also had another 65 or so that were also quarantined. Um, so we, we had a problem that these officers, so they don't bring COVID into the station and get us all infected, if they had COVID at home, we would quarantine them. If you can understand, you know, we're not a barber shop. We never get to flip the sign over and say we're closed. We, you know, we're a 24 hour, seven day a week operation. We share a fleet, we share equipment, we share office space. Um, it's very, very hard to control all that and keep the people from uh, being contaminated. But we're working through that and uh, it's been tremendous. I want to tell you just a little bit about the, the department, but I also want to talk about uh, Ward 4. I, I can tell you that the Brockton Police Department prides itself in being a full service police department. And what I mean by that is if you call us, first you're going to speak with a live person, okay? We don't do that dial one, dial two, all this other thing. I want you to speak with a live person because we understand that if you're calling, it's something that's important to you and we'll deal with it. We also send a police car. We send an officer to every call that we receive. We don't tell people that we don't send. Sometimes people get upset that it's not timely because it's not a high priority call and our calls get prioritized, but we send an officer to everything. If you have a flat tire, we will send a car to stand by and help you. 
okay, things of that nature. Then we have all the things that happen in the city. As you saw, uh, we had a horrific week last week. As you saw, one of our offices was uh, uh, responded to a 911 emergency, and he's, he's doing okay. He calls my office every day, wants to come back. He's, um, he's, he's a really good kid, he's very fortunate. Three officers responded and they started getting shot at and he was struck uh, multiple times. But he's doing okay. I, once again, the community came. I, I was answering phone calls and I've been getting cards on his behalf at the station and if, for those of you, uh, thank you. We also had the incident up at the school, which we take very serious. Whenever a firearm comes into a school, you know, the schools here in the city, there's a lot of schools we deal with, I, I think, are right around 16,000 kids, 17,000 kids. That's a large part of the population in the city of Brockton that's condensing together all day. Um, the, the mayor was right on it. Uh, the school department acted, I thought, amazingly in the way they handled it. They trained for it, and uh, they did a great job. Um, since then, we, we have a Brockton police officer that serves, uh, I mean a Brockton police ranking officer who serves as the person in charge of the school police. Since then, we've doubled that up. We've doubled up assets. We're sending more ranking personnel up there to assist with that, with everything that's going on. Um, and we remain the busiest police department per capita in the Commonwealth. Uh, with the number of officers that we have, we're going to answer, we're on track to answer just north of 140,000 calls for service this year. Um, so that's what we have going on. Down here in Ward 4, you've shared some of the things that have happened throughout the city during COVID, which are things that um, I think COVID's made people a little crazy. Uh, it's definitely made them bad drivers. Um, it, it just has. Um, people haven't been driving a lot and the schools have been closed. We've been having a real tough time with the, with the school buses in the morning and the afternoon. Um, and we, have, we, we do a lot of traffic enforcement for people that pass by the buses. It's just getting people in a mindset with that. And you know, we also spend time in the school zones, like the Huntington School's a problem um, when it lets out on there. We have to have uh, assets down there to help out with that. Um, we also, because of COVID, we had to uh, disband a couple of things, but what's come back, like in Camp Palo, You'll see, you'll see officers doing the walking beats. Okay, we have the officers doing the walking beats to protect the merchants and to also address any issues that come up and to give an overall feeling of safety for the people that go to these, uh, these shops. We've seen a lot during COVID. We've seen a lot of, uh, a lot of house parties, a lot of crazy house parties. Uh, the city has gotten into the mode of, we, we make it a priority one call. We send multiple cruisers. And we, if it's a habitual thing, and let me just explain that, if somebody keeps having these parties, we do end up charging the homeowner the purple to be able to have it. It's different than if we get a call and we go there and it's a family wedding, a one-time event. So there's a little judgment that goes into it. Um, but we've addressed, we've addressed some of that. Um, you've seen how ATVs and mini bikes have been out of control riding in the street. We've also, we've also cracked down on that. I know we. We reported to the city council not too long ago that we put out extra patrols and last time I checked uh, when we reported to the city council, uh, we had towed over 90 of them. Now we're around 120 that we've towed um, just with that. So we've been trying to crack down on some of these things that have, uh, that have come about. Um, so in, in those things have been actually seen quite a lot in Ward 4 and I, I just wanted to take time to explain that to you and thank you for your patience. We are, we are continuing to address some of those things. And as was said earlier, we're also, because of COVID, we, didn't, uh, we, we really couldn't do a lot of it and a lot of businesses were closed, but we're getting back more in the habit of doing a lot more code enforcement uh, to regulate hours and things of that nature that, that are uh, quality of life issues for neighbors around some of these businesses. You know, um, I'd, I'd like to answer any questions if anybody has any questions. Yes, sir. Uh, no, we are not. We have not up to this point. Well, we, 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 we did, um, when the city offered uh, the flu shot, not the flu shots, but you're talking about COVID. The, the, the officers, a lot of the officers availed themselves to that, and a lot of the officers have been uh, vaccinated. Yes. Oakland Street down to Clifton Ave, and then 
it's like a big racetrack. Yes. Around 11 o'clock, um, usually Saturday nights. It, all right, it's every night, but it's really bad Saturday nights. Um, it, and they go right down into West Bridgewater, and they come down past your brother's house. And I mean, yeah, it's, it's if, crazy. If you, um, you know, for those who don't know, you're talking about my, uh, my family uh, homestead. Um, I'm forever there planting grass and, and, and fixing things. Um, what, Copeland Street has been a, an, an ongoing problem for us for a long time, and from time to time you see several officers out there enforcing it. We get a buildup of speed that comes out of West Bridgewater and continues in. The other, the other thing that happened that, that's kind of a pro and con with police workers, when Copeland Street got redone, whenever streets get redone, speed picks up. And that's, there's, <laughs> They, they, you know, they, there's always a give and take, and, but we try, and I, I would say that in Ward 4, we, we spend a lot of time on Copeland Street. No, I think it worked for two weeks, and then it stopped flashing, and then I think the sign might even be gone, I'm not sure. That, As you uh, come into West Bridgewater, it was the flashing one. Right. That's I'm, gone. I'm not sure about that. But we'll spend, we'll spend more time up on Copeland Street. It's, it's continuous, and it's... And it, 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 Copeland is a problem for us because it's continuous throughout the day. There's the morning commute, there's the afternoon commute, and then there's the stuff later at night. And trust me, my family calls me on it all the time. Good, good. <laughs> <laughs> if not, I will. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, we fought for a stop sign for a long time at, Car at Carl Ave in Southfield. Okay. Okay. First of all, the speed on that road is supposedly 30 miles an hour. I will bet you if you put a time trap down there, average speed, average, is 47, without a doubt. And a stop sign, it's not a stop sign if you're going into Southfield Gardens or Davis Commons. It's, well, I don't see anyone, so I'm just going to turn. And it's the other way on the other, the other side, coming from Carl Ave, turning it right on Southfield. If they don't see anyone coming, don't even step on the brakes. Well, that's been a problem for uh, us for this years. Is, Ever since they had the right on red thing, people forget the stop on the red, red stop sign. People just get to a stop sign and roll through it. Uh, when they changed that law, it, it's, it's been a continuous problem for us because a lot of people don't stop, don't come to a full stop before they do the... No, the, they don't the, even the, pretend stop to stop. Sign. Correct. And I'd live three houses down before Carlisle, I mean, before Southfield Chief Gardens. I've, and I've been stopped at that stop line, and I've had yeah, we, we've, we've been really addressing those, the, the mini bikes and the, the, be, we have to, but I also want people to know that we will not, we will not be enforcing it to the point where we're going to get somebody hurt. Okay, there's, there's a point in time when common sense comes into play, and we've had good luck in identifying some kids later. We've had good luck going to their houses later, speaking with parents, taking the machine from the house. We've done all that. I, I just don't want the city to make a bad situation worse by, by hurting any of these kids. And, you know, especially when they don't know how to ride these things very well or they're not wearing safety equipment. We do get to a point where we say we're backing off, just so you understand. Take off and go down the, the uh, high tension wires. They can. Down uh, on Plain Street, and that's how they get away. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, it's, I got to go to one more event before I go home tonight. I'm supposed to be somewhere at 8 o'clock, so let me just, real quick, couple things if I could. Um, relative to the stop signs, we have a traffic commissioner, Captain Mark Picaro, that can uh, address anything. Um, crosswalks, um, safety signs. We have a traffic commission, two city councils sit on that. So chief can give you a captain's number and we'll address that. Um, good news, uh, we are having a holiday parade like we always have, all right, the Saturday, the Saturday after Thanksgiving. It's gonna be downtown. It's gonna be a little smaller scale, but we're gonna do one, we need to do it. It's a community holiday gathering, a celebration. So that's one good thing. I'm not gonna be the big bad mayor. I'm not canceling trick or treat. My kids would kill me. So we are gonna be doing trick or treating as well. If you answer the door, what I'm gonna do when I give out candy, I am gonna wear a mask, but it's up to you if you wanna do it individually wrapped. Um, again, if you're an ath uh, a fan of sports and specifically boxing, 
Uh, next Tuesday night, we're going to show the Marciano Joe Lewis fight, Rocky versus Joe Lewis. It's the 70th anniversary. We're doing that at West Middle School. Um, and then if you are an Italian, today we did the Italian flag raising ceremony at City Hall, and it was awesome. And the chief was doing a dance that I've never seen before. He was so excited. But listen, um, I want to thank the council for having me here. I do have to go to one more event, but... Great. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. So um, thank you. Dave Farrell, who is a veteran, who serves as federal agent, we are doing it. It's going to kick off again at the War Memorial. We're going to go all the way around. We're going to end at the City Hall, the GAR, Grand Army of the Republic. And one other thing, we did, we never did this in the city of Brockton, but we were designated uh, a Purple Heart City. Um, we had 26 Purple Heart recipients or their families. Um, six of them were still living, 20 had passed and we celebrated them last week. If any of you know a Purple Heart recipient, living or dead, please let us know. We want to continue to do this, right? We need to. And what I did know is Brockton has two Congressional Medal of Honor winners from Brockton, Lieutenant Fox and, and Colonel Craig, uh, Corporal Craig. I didn't know that, but that's a fact. And the last thing is you hear about this federal money, ARPA money, ARPA money, American Rescue, we're getting 34 million. We already have 17 million from the feds. Now the 17 come in next year, okay? And then we're getting 4 million from the county. Plymouth County gets this ARPA money as well. I spoke to um, State Representative uh, Majority Leader Claire Cronin, uh, soon to be the ambassador to Ireland, and Claire and I spoke again today. Uh, and Rep Cassidy, Cronin, Dubois, and State Senator Brady are helping us on this because there's going to be an additional part of ARPA money that Beacon Hill will get that Brockton will triple down. But why I bring this up is um, on Monday morning, I, I asked IT to put a, a citizen survey. Um, I want to hear from anybody and everybody if you think there's some ideas to use ARPA money, federal money. Um, please go on the survey. It will take you less than five minutes. And again, we're all in this together because we are better together. I'm going to run right now before they kill me at the next meeting. I'll see you. Thank you. Good evening, uh, count aloud here. Um, Tony Rodriguez, uh, the Ward 4 School Committee member here. Uh, a little bit about myself, 22-year um, resident, Ward 4. I live right on Cushion Road, right before you get to E Street in the Bend. Um, married, uh, my wife works for the school district. Uh, she's an uh, adjustment counselor at the Keats Center. Um, three children. My oldest is a senior at UMass Lowell. Uh, in engineering, chemicals and plastic. And he also works for the school. My daughter's a um, sophomore at the high school. And my little one is in the third grade at the uh, Kennedy School. Three months into, the, uh, into my term, COVID hit. As an elected official, like, wow. I just get on the school committee. The SOA, the Student Opportunity Act, was passed. We got all this money flowing into the city. Uh, we approve all these hirings in, in uh, implementing uh, certain policies to move the school district um, to where it should be. Um, if anybody had the opportunity to read the uh, DESE report, uh, it wasn't a, a real nice one. So uh, we sat down as the committee and we uh, looked at you know, what's needed um, as far as our student um, population. Um, we've lost a, a great amount of students to other districts, uh, so we have to, you know, work together to see how we can bring these students back in here. Um, I'm a big, <coughs> um, graduated in 97, just want to uh, point that out, uh, football my whole life. I'm a big uh, athletics guy. Uh, I know the mayor left. Uh, I've been pounding pounding, pounding on facilities because um, our student athletes are leaving the city in droves. Um, I think that's a major part that the city needs to move forward in investing into our facilities, specifically here in the Davis. Um, I've been talking to the superintendent, uh, Councillor Rodriguez. Um, about six years ago, uh, roughly when uh, Mayor Carpenter uh, was in office, God rest his soul. There was a plan to place another school behind the Davis to go into the commons with the football facility right in the middle. 
Um, the plan still exists, so we're working on that to make sure that uh, we bring that to life here in uh, Ward 4 so that we have facilities for these kids to play and also for the residents. Uh, they want to walk around the track. You don't have to go to the high school. That also includes me fighting for the uh, middle schools as well where we implemented uh, middle school football. We haven't had it since the 60s. So we brought that back. We roughly have about 200 kids that are participating in that. Uh, I went to West Junior High, so they're out in Wellesley today. They're probably done with the game. Uh, hopefully they won. So uh, I'm fighting for the, the four middle schools to actually have a complex because uh, during our fall season, we have boys and girls soccer, football, and cross country. So if you take a visit to any of these schools, we don't have the facilities to sustain that. And one thing that I'm going to pound on is that some people might get pissed off is that if we're going to invest $98 million in a public safety building that we desperately need, um, I'm also in law enforcement 20 years with the Department of Corrections with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We should invest into our student athletes. That's, it's, it's greatly needed. Um, these kids have been out of school for two years, almost two years, and we're seeing the effects that COVID had on them with all the problems that we are having uh, across the district. Um, I hate getting the confidential phone call every evening of what's going on in the district with kids fighting uh, with a gun incident. Um, that was like one of, the, one of the worst calls that you can get um, as a parent, uh, as an elected official, somebody in law enforcement. Um, I was actually working in detail at Good Sam and my 16-year-old daughter texted me that there's a lot of police at the school, what's going on? Now, how do I tell her to, you know, let her know what's really going on to keep her calm? Um, a lot of people shine on law enforcement, you know, specifically, why do we have uh, a school police force at the high school? I think we're the only one besides Boston that does have a police force. I don't think we have enough police officers in this city. And hopefully with the mayor's office and our councilors, they can approve more money because we need about 400 police officers in this city. We need to keep everybody safe. Uh, on the school side, um, we're going to gain another school. Thank you to the councilors that approved it at the uh, recent meeting. On the May Institute on Summer Street, 596, if I'm not mistaken with the number, uh, we're going to move the Keats Center um, to Ward 4 on Summer Street, and that will open up the door <clears throat> to the public safety building, which is great. It's, it's, it's needed. Um, we need to have a place that, that everybody can go. It's every, all your business is going to be conducted into that one building. So that's going to be a, a, a major... Um, upgrade to our uh, key center students because they've been bounced around the city for quite a bit from the Huntington to B.B. Russell School. Now they're going to be here. So this is going to be their permanent home. Um, it's a beautiful facility. Uh, we're looking at making that transition um, once everything is finalized during the uh, December break. Um, and there was a question on the uh, critical race theory um, within our school district with the curriculum, how it's affecting our schools and our students. Uh, one of the major things that we did um, was create the Office of Diversity and Inclusion uh, where we have the director and we just hired uh, another individual to actually focus just on the curriculum part. So the office is, is brand new uh, with the direction uh, with um, Ms. Waldron, uh, Lisa Rodriguez, Renee Hayward. Renee Hayward, and there's somebody else that we just um, put in there. Darnell, Lisa Rodriguez and Darnell Williams. Darnell Williams. <clears throat> so they're putting that office together, um, working on the curriculum. Um, and that's... <clears throat> You really ask yourself, race theory, what, how does it, where do you start? How does it affect? We all know that history books only tells who won. It doesn't really tell the story of the losers. The winners are the ones that tell the story. So they're putting that together where the school committee will be, 
you know, they will present it to us and then we'll see how it's implemented into our schools. So it's not just, I, I mean, you know, one of the meetings I made a comment where one of the members <clears throat> made a comment and, you know, and, I, and I, I had to step in and say, you know, it's not just about Martin Luther King. It's not about Rosa Parks. There's a lot of more minorities that their stories are not told. So it's that office that's gonna bring that into the school district to teach that. It's not where we're gonna get rid of everything, but it's adding that curriculum so we can implement where the minorities, the stories that haven't been told. I don't know if I answered your question, if, if that's, did I answer that correctly for you? If this, she's the one that answered it, that wanted the question. Thank you. I'm listening. You speak. I'm listening to you. No, there are many aspects to the CRT. It isn't just teaching about racing together. It's a separation of the races. And I can give you an, a, a very small example that happened. My next door neighbor is 15, goes to vocational school, great kid. And when he gets off the bus, he's right in front of my house. So I says, Colton, how are things at school? I like my teachers, but he says, school is not the same this year. So I asked him what was going on. He says, there's things like this. A white, a black boy called a white boy, a cracker. The white boy called the black boy a cotton picker. The white boy was suspended. The black boy got nothing. And it wouldn't have had to be black against white. It could have been Chinese against black or Chinese against white. My own grandson is Korean. My great grandson is Korean. He has taken a multitude of abuse at school, but he manages to wash it off. So, it's like trying to divide the children into groups by skin color, by nationalities, and white people are considered privileged, and we should keep more quiet and not be heard. And that's part of it. And I think a lot of it came to light with the pandemic and the children working at home and virtual, and their parents were seeing on the screen what was going on. And it wasn't pretty at times. So I just kind of wondered where Brockton stood with their curriculum on this. That, that's actually being worked on. When, when, when you say, <clears throat> when you look at Brockton, it's 70% minority. And if you look at the data, I don't have it in front of me, but if you look at the data, the minorities are the ones that are getting the most discipline in this city. So if you look at it. Minority against minority too. Yes, it's, there's so many different cases. There's so many different cases. It's not saying that because he's white, he's gonna get 10 day suspension or he's black, he doesn't get anything because he said this because we, we're bringing in critical race theory. It's about educating everybody, including minorities. We're not getting rid of any of that. We're just adding to it. Because we're not getting rid of any of that. We're just adding to it. Because it's, 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 a, it's not just, it's globally. It's across the United States. Yes, it is. It's, it's across the United States. So it's not where we're nitpicking at a certain ethnic group or we have to educate everybody about every race. But predominantly the minority race, the, People of color have suffered. And I don't know how your upbringing was or anybody else's. It's totally different from my point of view from yours. Well, see, I worked eight years at the same school in elementary education. And we had 
had a lot of minority kids. We had the Hill Street kids. We had the Plymouth Street kids. We had, there were some great kids. And we really had a, a, a group of teachers who gave up their time freely after school to make little, uh, one teacher had a basketball team, another one had arts and crafts for girls. They weren't paid for that. But now they can't do any of those things because the union doesn't allow it. The teachers' union holds some of the best teachers we have. They hold them back. They want to do more for the kids. They can't. So I don't know what you can do about that. It's a team effort. So we, we're going to look at it and try to do the best that we can. But when you look at the data, when you look at a minority student, they perform better when they have somebody that represents them. So if you go through your whole high school career, your whole educational career, I'm Cape Verdean. I was born in the United States. I was, in the, I was placed in the bilingual program because my parents didn't speak English that well, but I did. It took the school department three years to figure that out. So, so now, not just learning the curriculum, but also they're trying to teach me how to speak English, which I already know. So that's a big failure there. But through my educational experience, I've never had a teacher of color, not even in college. Not even in college. If I did have, when I walked through Brockton High and I seen a teacher of color, I was like, damn, why can't I have that person as my educator in my class? Because it gives you a sense that that person represents you. And also, kids that have issues with learning will pay attention more because, oh, that's somebody. Yeah. A lot of burden on their shoulders. And if you just have a class in general and you don't pay attention individually, these kids get lost in the shuffle. So you, have, you know some kids live with the grandmother, the grandmother's too old, the child is too small. We had kids that came to school. I had a little girl that came to school every day, dirty, and her lunch was a thermos bottle full of water and a cold hot dog. So we kind of kept food there for her and clothing, cleaned her up for the day, which was against all rules. But she, had a, she felt like part of being the kids. And I don't know how much of that is going on, if there's that same compassion, but that's one thing I learned. You really have to know your kids. Yes, that's, that's, that's true. I mean, everybody has a, a different lifestyle. Um, that was one of my biggest concerns was the kids that have broken homes, especially when the pandemic hit and they're doing remote learning. And are they eating? Because most of the time, these kids look forward to coming to school because that's where they got their meals. When we first started doing the uh, grab and go, you know, a city of Brockton with 17,000 students, we were only handing out 4,600 meals. So we're, what's going on? Transportation. I had a parent, my mother called me and said that she, where did she go to get the food? I said, any school. She thought she had to go to the other side of town because that's where the school that the child went to. You know, when we had the incident down in Fall River where the parents weren't taking care, a child died. You know, this is, you know, COVID hit a lot of families hard. And remote learning is not the way to teach. I'm sorry. You know, I stayed home. I watched my son do it. You know, I'm in the living room, and he's jumping on the bed. You know, he's in the second grade because they have to move around. Now, imagine the kids that are in school at that age that have to put a mask on. You know, so with the, on, the, on the racial part, um, there's never enough where you can talk about this racism everywhere, but it's our job to make sure that everybody understands everyone's culture. The district is actually doing a, an event November 2nd to, 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 to basically introduce the equity diversity um, department in, this, in the district. And they 
um, working with teachers and Is this on? Yes, okay. Uh, a couple of things I want to say. You have X amount of hours in a day, you have X amount of hours in a school week. So if you add this program, what are you going to cut? You're already forcing MCAS down these kids' throats. All, and it doesn't teach any practical experience. I'll bet you if you go up to the high school, ask a kid, how are you going to pay off a credit card? Uh, how do you balance a checkbook? Better still, how do you change a flat tire? They have no idea in the world. You want an MCAS test? Go park out in front of uh, Brockton High on Belmont Street or Forest Ave in January and see who's walking down the street without a jacket on, in shorts, and in a t-shirt. That's your MCAS test. If they're walking down that street and they're in high school, Dress like that in the winter, they don't belong there. Second of all, you're talking about student athletics. You want bang for your buck? Look what the student musicians in Broughton have done. You've got a world-class band, or had a world-class band here two years ago. You've got more professional musicians in the field. You've got more professional teachers You've got more professional music department directors graduating from the uh, Broughton Music Department. How many professional athletes do you have? That's where you should be investing your money. Look at your choral program. Look at your arts program. That's where your money should be spent. Bank for your buck. Now let's talk about out front here. Come by here at 2 o'clock. Come by here at 7.30. You can't get by here. You've got cars parked on both sides of the road because my kid's more important than you. You have cars that are backed up all the way around. You can't drive in because they are parked across the street trying to get into the parking lot. Then you get on the other end. You have the police officer there. They see a bus at the stop end corner of the lot. They're holding up the traffic so that bus can turn onto Plain Street. It's ridiculous and it's the same thing over at Huntington and it's even worse up at the high school. I haven't been up to high school since COVID, but they'd let out 27 buses at a whack and hold up the traffic. And I believe state law says you can only hold up seven cars at a whack as a crossing guard. Have some consideration for the people that don't have kids in school. I, I agree with you. I'm not prejudiced to any of those programs, but you got to realize that the city of Brockton has been underfunded for the past 10 years. So if, you ask, so if you're going to ask yourself, do you want to increase our arts program or our athletics program or vocational, or do you want to lose two or five teachers in the classroom? I think the teachers in the classroom are more important than athletics or any of that. Now that the money's flowing into the city and more, we're adding that. We just saved millions of dollars with adding busing. We're bringing busing in-house. In, in folk, the traffic here, I see it, I'm here. The plan that, you know, Brett Gormley and others is to hook the bend from the front to out back so there's a connection so the buses can line up from the back all the way around so they can ease the traffic stop that's here. I know the parents that stop on the street to pick up their children, the, the parking is not that big because you have staff parking. This is one of the, this is the largest elementary school for ours with the student ratio. You, you have over a thousand. We have some parents that, that I've met in the community that don't like the idea 
of this being a K through eight. So now if you get rid of that, you know, six to eight, where are we gonna put them? All of our schools are old. Trust me, if we have a billion dollars and we can knock down these schools and build new ones, we'll do it. I'll vote for it. But we have to put a plan. The city moves in a, you know, a certain way, you know? So we have to look at our budget and see where we're going to put the money. Is the money there? Yeah, but we're not going to just go and spend it just because it's there. We, have to, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You know, COVID hit. That, that woke everybody up. What if something comes that's more drastically than that? Hi, hi, Tony. Um, I have questions around um, Champion Charter School because I live directly across the street from it. So I just, my concern is one, the safety for the children getting let out of school. Um, you know, what's the plan as far as getting them to, when they get out, going home instead of walking along the way because there's really no um, sidewalks for the kids to be over there. And that area literally is a speedway. There was a horrific accident that happened the other night you just get really concerned. I work from home, so I tend to see a lot of the kids walking from school, and I just get concerned when I see them not having a sidewalk to walk on and not feeling that they're safe. My kids are grown, but you're still a parent. You don't lose that feeling of being a parent. It doesn't matter how grown your kids are. And I just get concerned about the kids' safety, and I want to make sure that with that school being across the street, that the same way Brockton High is managed, because this too is a high school, that these kids will be monitored and things will run in that same manner. I don't want to have an incident like the whole Brockton High thing happened. I don't want some child bringing some gun into that school. And you know, we live in a residential neighborhood. It's not a huge school. It's ideal that it is one, but it's not huge. So I'm just looking from a safety perspective. What do they have in place for that location? Thank you. At the top of my head, I will look into that for you. Um, you got to realize that certain streets, there's certain parameters and how, how wide they are, if they can have sidewalks, if they can't have sidewalks. But I will look into that for you um, to see you know, what we can do. Uh, as far as crossing guards, um, the traffic department, you know, you know, we'll bring that, I'll bring, I will look into that for you. I don't have a definite answer. One thing that, that I just want, like, you know, if you have students in the school system, grandsons, or anything, or your neighbor, just have them keep an eye on their children with, um, with the social media, with their cell phones. Um, we have a real bad problem with these kids at the school. Um, and they're doing these challenges, and it's, it, it's getting really dangerous, um, pulling fire alarms. You gotta understand, you know, a school like Brockton High with 4,200 students, plus staff, you have over 5,000. And you have to evacuate that, that whole building and you're using resources from the fire department and the police. We have kids that are handicapped, that they have to get out of there. Um, and we don't, we, we're not taking that stuff lightly. Um, it's, it's a very dangerous situation, very dangerous. These TikTok challenges, um, putting their hands on staff, Kids are in the restroom. We had to shut down the restrooms. Um, we diverting our bus drivers to be um, hall monitors. Um, I work in a prison, and I don't want my child or anybody else's child to feel like they're going to school and it's a prison. They're there to learn. And these kids are, are losing class time because of other students that don't respect the, uh, the, the learning environment. So if you, if you can just share that information with your neighbors, the kids, you know, we don't want to come to a point where no cell phones are allowed. And I know some parents need to get in contact with their kids, but if it was up to me, I don't have that sole authority, I will take that away. No cell phones allowed in those schools. You're there to learn, not to potty, not to fight, not making flyers, going to these uh, food chain restaurants and, 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 and having these fights. Uh, it, you don't want to go in that path. It, it, it's, it's not a good one. And bring them up. 
because I saw a program on TV and I was shocked. There was a group of little kindergartners sitting on the floor being read to by a drag queen dressed in full drag and she had a book with her, uh, him, I don't know what you call him, and he had a whole book full of all different kinds of drag queens. That is certainly not age appropriate for kindergarten. And those are the things that are part of the CRT program. So I would just request from you to keep an eye on what's going on with the curriculum. And if it isn't something that's going to be helpful to them or age appropriate for them, leave it out. No, it's, because it's, they need better things. It'll be age appropriate. I mean, it's, it's going to be age appropriate. And far as, sir, I'm for the financial literacy, you know, learning how to really navigate the real world, you know, how to pay, same thing that you said, how to change the tire, all that, vocational. I honestly think the school district needs a vocational school, you know, plumbing, electricians, all that, so we can get the workforce. Not every kid, and not every child goes to college. We, we understand that. And I appreciate the comments. Uh, reach out to me. Um, email, phone number, I got my card. If anybody wants to talk, that's how, we change, that's how we build our school district. That's how we build our city. Reach out to the chief, the fire chief, the mayor's office, your school committee member. Get that information and we bring it to the committee. Let's work this out. Let's put a plan into place. Comment. <laughs> Just a comment. Um, on the after school sports and other activities, they are so important for children to attend. And I would never be an advocate of not funding those. That's all. Okay, thank you. So that concludes. Another interesting and rather long Ward 4 meeting. I want to thank all of you and, and everyone who was here for attending. I especially want to thank my speakers, Chief Nardelli, Chief Gomes, committee, school committee member Rodriguez, and Mayor Sullivan. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night.